back in the room. So automatic recording. There should be a mic underneath the desk. No, there's nothing. I think somebody walked off very much. Yeah, usually when I use this uh, room, it doesn't have a mic. It doesn't have a mic? Yeah. But the video is okay? Uh, it seems the recorder video is okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think more people are searching for this room because it's not a normal center. Okay. <laughs> I see a lot of people walking around, figuring out where 20 to 40 is. Uh, eventually they'll figure it out. But I think for another 20, 30 people will join the next 10 minutes. Do one more minute and then we'll get started. So maybe while we're waiting, um, I'm just so excited to be here. Um, I grew up in the Carolinas. Uh, my All of my uh, relatives, aunts and uncles, my parents, I grew up in, in North Carolina, in Clinton, North Carolina, if you know where that is. I'm a, a little bit uh, just east on I-40 for a while. Um, I have relatives in Greensboro. Uh, they're all state fans, you know, uh, on Facebook and text messages every football game because I'm a Clemson grad, and so I get, you know, this, it's a nice little rivalry between yeah, media. NC State. Yes, yes, you guys finally did it. <laughs> I, so. got to, I, got to, I got to see it live. <laughs> oh, that must have been, that was an exciting oh, game. Really exciting uh, double game. overtime, I think. So, uh, so you know, NC State has always had a special place in my heart. I have a a uh, graduate student in my lab right now from NC State, um, and so it's fun, uh, you know, joking with her, um, you know, whenever Clemson and NC State get to play, and uh, um, my first college road trip, in fact, when I was, uh, was, I was a freshman at Clemson, um, I got to come to NC State to watch a, a football game here, so uh, NC State's always kind of had a special place, so, uh, that's great. no pack, is that the, is that the, <laughs> yeah, that's the, <laughs> All right, let's, let me introduce uh, Warren here, if we can get started. Uh, Warren Dixon uh, is the department head uh, for the last year at the University of Florida, Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Uh, he's been there since the beginning of his career. And interestingly, I met him when he was an assistant professor, and I was a just turned associate professor, I think. So he came to visit LSU at the time, and we had dinner together and all the stuff. And I could never forget him because he was... So energetic at that time. And I said, this guy's going to be a leader one day. That's what I said. I still remember that. And there you go. You know, premonition, providence, whatever you want to call it. But, but, but he's, he's been very successful. He's, uh, he got his PhD from Clemson, as he said. We'll, let him, we'll forgive him for that. But, uh, but he has worked as, uh, at Oak Ridge uh, until 2004. And then he joined Florida in 2004. And now the department head, like I said, the dean's leadership professor and department chair. Again, they're the mechanical and aerospace engineering, just like us. Uh, his interest primarily is in controls, uh, uh, nonlinear systems, uh, Lyapunov-based control techniques, and he's got a lot of awards, uh, and it's all on the website. He said, "Don't embarrass me," and he got all the list. But certainly, young investigator award, and more eventually senior awards. And we expect for anybody uh, who is uh, accomplished in the area. So, without further ado, uh, Warren, take it away. Thank you. So, uh, my my areas of research, is, as Srina said, is uh, in in control theory, autonomy in general. And so, uh, in my group, we work on a variety of applications. Um, one of the big areas that we do in my group is rehabilitation engineering. Uh, one of my uh, best students ever, uh, Dr. Sharma here, is in the biomedical uh, engineering department. Uh, uh, Becca Hart uh, was an REU student last summer at Florida, uh, working on a rehab engineering uh, work. Again, another great NC State connection. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about that aspect today. Um, we have a center of excellence from the Air Force um, at University of Florida now, um, and it's focused on assured autonomy in contested environments. And uh, that research domain really pulls together a lot of different ideas that we're working on, um, uncertainty, optimality, and uh, in adversarial environments, and natural environments as well, but especially in adversarial environments, you have situations where um, there's this famous uh, article, The Joy of Feedback, uh, and you can do a lot of things if you're continuously getting error corrections. 
But uh, what happens when you don't have the joy of feedback? And so what happens when you only intermittently can determine, hey, this action that I took was a good action or it was a bad action? And how does that play in with learning and with optimality? And so that's, I'm going to, unfortunately, it'll be a little bit of a, of a breadth seminar today uh, without getting into a lot of depth. So some of you may go, God, I wanted to see some equations. And some of you are like, oh, God, thank you. It's not going to give us all those equations. <laughs> Um, but uh, so, so the Center of Excellence uh, focuses on uh, a number of different topics. Um, it has some cyber effects, some wireless comms effects, uh, some mission planning kind of effects. But uh, today we'll, we'll touch on the adaptation optimality, uh, not so much the synthesis. Um, uh, some of the intermittency of feedback is important when you're doing network control and control over networks. Um, and then because you have intermittency, that causes you to have a non-smooth system, so uh, or a hybrid system, if you're familiar with that vocabulary. So it's a mix of continuous time dynamics and discrete time dynamics. So let me just jump right into the learning aspect first. And so uh, unless you've been living under a rock for uh, a decade, uh, you're very aware that AI and deep learning is very, uh, very active research area right now. Uh, these are some areas that you hear a lot about. Um, those areas are all uh, uh, developing a map, a static map, um, you know, image character recognition in the 80s when neural networks first came into, uh, into Nouveau, and now these are just fancier image character recognition problems in, in, in my perspective. So input, output, static map, um, you recognize an image, you do something like that. Uh, it's great, fun problems for all the people who work in that area. Um, but the uh, techniques that you would apply, so, so deep learning when it's like image recognition is a very different problem for deep learning for an autonomous system. Because uh, when, when you hear about deep learning and AI, uh, what you hear about is, well, we had this massive data set and we, we trained it on a GPU for, for two weeks and it converged after this number of epics to this, to the mean square error got down to small. And, um, and then we implemented it. And what's kind of odd from my perspective is that it's all about learning and AI and artificial intelligence, and then when it's implemented, it's just locked. There's no more learning, uh, because all that was pre-trained and, and pre-canned. And effectively, what happened is it was just a different way to generate a model. Uh, you could have used first principles to generate a model, or in this case, we're using AI to generate a model based on input, output, and you know, function approximation. So um, what we would like to do in, in autonomous systems is we're in an environment that's dynamically changing. The, the, uh, there's a temporal sense of things. Um, you know, uh, maybe the closed set that we had for training doesn't really match anymore, or uh, maybe it was sparse and we just don't have a lot of data. We couldn't operate in that environment. Uh, before we need to execute in that environment. And so, um, but there's, there's a challenge, a technical challenge, and I'll uh, skim over that in, in just a few moments. Um, but for us, uh, we want to, to overcome some of, those, some of those obstacles that are great for these like matching problems, but, but not so great for autonomy problems. And so we, we don't uh, necessarily want to do a lot of offline training, but if you have that data, sure, we'll use it. Um, if you have the time to train, sure we can, but we don't have to. Um, the closed training set is a real problem because, uh, as I talked about for the center, it's about assured autonomy. And at first, um, AI methods were, were out. That wasn't in the scope because, well, how can you assure uh, the performance of something when you trained it on a closed set? Because what happens in the black swan event happens and there's some data that's outside of your learning set. How is it going to respond? How can you assure how it's going to respond? And so initially that was out of our scope, but in some of our recent developments, we've been able to have performance guarantees uh, um, so that uh, we, can, we can make comments on, we can assure uh, the learning, we can bound the learning. Um, and again, I mentioned you know, learning in open loop or, or learn something and then lock it down and implement it. Uh, we've, some of the methods that I'll show you, uh, we're able to continuously learn, which now the community is starting to pay more attention to. It's, it's one thing to do offline learning, but how can we continuously learn and continuously update? Um, so to get into some of the details of, uh, of our contributions here, um, this first equation 
Um, here is, is a typical representation of how you can use a neural network to do function approximation. Um, there's a universal function approximation property based on the stone weierstrass theorem that says any continuous bounded function you can approximate using this equation within some prescribed precision epsilon at the end. Um, where W is just a, a, a vector uh, of static weights uh, multiplied by an activation function. Now, for shallow neural networks, which have been used, say, from the 80s up until recently, um, you could uh, factor out some of the uncertainties within this basis function here, and uh, this outer layer weights, this W, is already affine in these dynamics, and so... So we could use uh, um, analysis methods to design the adaptation laws. So, so we're not just coming up with adaptation laws. The analysis is dictating to us what the adaptation law should be for certain convergence and stability properties. Um, but the problem, uh, just very acutely, with when you want to go from shallow neural networks to deep neural networks, is now this basis function here, this phi, is this composition of nonlinear functions. And so it's like this Russian nested doll, where it's a nonlinearity inside of a nonlinearity inside of a nonlinearity. And, th and that, that nesting of the nonlinearity gives you better function approximation properties. However, it makes it incredibly difficult to uh, determine um, adaptation laws and adjust your weights of those because they're nested with inside of nonlinearities inside of nonlinearities. And so that's been... Um, and that remains the barrier for doing analysis-based adaptation for, to understand what these weights are. So to date, we've made uh, two kinds of contributions to address this problem. The first contribution came from the realization that, um, so, so if, if we look at this equation uh, and we develop an, an approximation for it, um, these outer layer weights, the W, as I said before, well, those are always affine in, in this equation. You can always factor them out linearly. And so, at the very least, um, can we update those in real time? And then the question came, yeah, but when you did the offline training, it was a balance between updating the outer layer shell and the inner layer shell all together. Now, if you start going monkeying around with the outer layer shell, does that really match with the inner layer anymore? And so, luckily, around the same time, we developed this, this method we call concurrent learning. And it's, uh, you know, embarrassingly, controls engineers, you know, we're all about input-output data uh, and feedback. Well, we would, we would take input and output, and we would, we would decide the next control action, and then we would just get rid of the data. Um, embarrassingly. And then we discovered, oh, gee whiz, maybe we should hang on to the data. It might still be useful for us. And so concurrent to execution, if we store the input-output data in, in a memory stack, then uh, while we're executing, in parallel, we can take this input-output data that we're collecting from the real environment, <clears throat> and we can do some parallel system identification methods with it. <clears throat> and we finally developed these mathematical tools to be able to determine when to turn that adaptation on, when to check, hey, <clears throat> has this offline learning that you've been doing kind of in parallel, uh, is that advantageous now? Have you learned something beneficial? If so, then hey, let's turn it on and use it now. And so we, we combine those two ideas to say, okay, well, let's pre-train uh, the, the deep structure, um, this basis function and everything, just like anyone would do in deep learning. Uh, but now let's, in real time, adjust this outer layer weights, this outer level shell, so we didn't just freeze everything. We're doing continuous adjustments to it. And while we're collecting, <clears throat> sorry, while we're collecting input-output data, let's store that, be tuning the inner layer weights concurrently or, or in this parallel process, and then using these mathematical tools that we have to be able to switch it on whenever it's useful, then that's what we do. And so we had this scheme of, I, I call it multiple time scale learning, where it's exactly as I, as I said, we have this slower than real time inner layer tuning in parallel to this in real time um, outer layer tuning. And because we're generating adaptation laws for the outer layer based on the stability analysis, 
we were able to guarantee uh, a certain level of performance from the learning, uh, asymptotic convergence and boundedness. And so now we have some assurances and we're not just working on this closed set, we're working on the actual data that we're experiencing in the environment. Um, and so I'm gonna skip over the math for the sake of time. Uh, here's a deep neural network. We had four layers uh, with, with different levels of neurons within each layer. Um, we did an off, so on this first example, um, we trained on the dynamics that we implemented it on. And so we, we did the, uh, this graph is just the traditional offline learning and you know, there's a certain number of epochs until our mean square error got down to a desired threshold and then we implemented it. Um, and these red and blue, li red and black dotted lines that are vertical here are when we collected data and then when we turned the, the new data on in terms of adjusting the inner layer weights. And you can see that <clears throat> over time and after these iterations, um, the error minimized. And so, well, that's great, but again, I mean, you trained on the actual dynamic system that you implemented it on, so, I mean, the excitement is a little mitigated there. So then we said, okay, well, then let's train on a different, and, oh, and this was a, um, a, a Lorenz oscillator, um, a Vanderpool oscillator, uh, just as a typical example of a nonlinear system that we did this uh, as a dynamics. And so here, we had a different oscillator that we trained on and tuned the inner layer weights and outer layer weights, and then we implemented it on a different dynamics. It's still an oscillator, but a different dynamics, different parameters. And so that's like transfer learning where we've learned on one dynamic system, but we want to implement it on a different dynamic system. And so the performance isn't as good uh, because there's more of a transient. We, we, we have to learn this new system that we're experiencing. Um, uh, but you can see that as we're adjusting those inner layer weights, the performance gets significantly better um, rather than just freezing it from the very beginning. And then we said, well, okay, we did that on a different dynamic system. So then we ask ourselves, okay, what if we just said we're not going to pre-train at all? Just randomize the initial weights uh, on the inner layers and, just, and we'll only train those inner layers based on data that we're experiencing in real time. So much worse performance, of course, that makes sense, but we still get convergence, we still eventually get good performance, and we didn't have to train at all. We had no data ahead of time. And so that's impactful for, for many applications. Um, very recently, earlier this year, we had a, a publication that just appeared where you know, this, this uh, switching in and out, uh, training and, and parallel learning at slower time scales, that's great, but is it possible to unwrap this Russian nested doll problem and let the analysis dictate uh, what the adaptation law should be for every weight in all the layers, arbitrarily deep, in real time, based on the stability analysis? And um, so after some mathematical manipulation, um, we, we unwrapped that nested nonlinearity in a way that we were able to have uh, the uncertainty, this phi hat, appear linearly with, uh, with our uncertainty uh, V tilde. And then we had these recursive terms where we had also appearing linearly these, these hat terms with the uncertainty. And, and then we had some higher order terms. And so the higher order terms, no problem. We just have some uh, robust control concepts that can just kind of uh, crush or dampen out those terms and mitigate their impact. Um, but because of the structure of this uh, linear, in the linear in the uncertain parameters term and this recursion term, we're able to design through the stability analysis, the stability analysis dictated to us what the design would be, to ensure stability, to ensure convergence, and it tells us how we should adjust the weights of every parameter in the deep neural network, arbitrarily deep, in real time, and like I said, if you have data, great, but if you don't, you're learning it in real time based on the actual environment you're operating in, which is exactly what we want for autonomous systems. And if we look at the structure of the adaptation law that emerges from the system, um, it's a standard gradient adaptation law. And you're like, well, geez, ho-hum, that wasn't very special. We, we would have hoped that that would have been something unique. But if you look a little deeper, there is some nuance here. I mean, so yes, this is a standard gradient adaptation type term, um, but it's got this lambda term, and we look at the lambda, 
and we see this kind of cross product term that, oh, okay, well, that's in there to cancel these, these terms. Okay, that's, that's where that was motivated from the stability analysis. And, um, okay, well, so, so the, yeah, there's a state in there. So, okay, this kind of looks like um, maybe it's a, a, a least squares kind of thing because we have this, this uh, you know, state dependent uh, gain essentially is what, what's in there. But then we also have this term Kasai that's sitting out in front. And if we look at that, then this is a, 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 a left product combination of these V hats and, and phi hat prime terms, which are these recursion terms. And, and those terms, uh, the analysis tells us that if we, if we multiply that times this in this adaptation law, then when we go through the analysis, we cancel all these recursion terms out, we cancel all these terms out, and then we have a very beautiful stability result in the end that gives us an asymptotic convergence result. So very happy with this result. I think I hope it's going to be very impactful because, like I said, it's, it's the first result that allows us to do in real time arbitrarily deep neural network adaptation from, with adaptation laws derived from the stability analysis. So we implemented it. Um, this was the dynamic system that we implemented it on. Uh, we had six uh, layers with seven neurons. We developed the mathematics so that we could handle discrete um, or, or um, uh, not continuous activation functions uh, because in the deep learning community, uh, ReLU uh, rectified linear unit um, activation functions are very popular. They're only piecewise continuous. Um, and then also in that community, leaky ReLU functions, uh, activation functions are very popular right now. And so we said, okay, let's use the older uh, continuous saturated 10H function, uh, which had been prevalent uh, up until more the uh, deep learning um, recent uh, innovations. So this is a, a, a continuously differentiable activation function. And then this is not a continuously differential activation function, but we had the mathematics that allowed us to, to handle those kinds of activation functions. Uh, this left column is with the leaky ReLU, and the, the right column is with the hyperbolic tangent. And as you can see, we get much better performance with the leaky ReLU. Um, you know, actually uh, factors uh, almost a, an order of magnitude uh, improvement. Um, oh, actually, I'm looking at the wrong ones. So, yeah, almost an order of magnitude improvement in the RMS error. Um, so we're very, very happy with that. So that's just a, a quick skim of uncertainty. And so how, you know, uncertainty and optimality are kind of like oil and water, right? Because how can you make the best decision when you're not even sure of the dynamics that you're operating in, right? I mean, that, that's just a philosophical contradiction, right? And to make matters worse... The actual question that we want to answer is, I want to make the best possible decision despite the fact that there's uncertainty in the environment, and I want to make that decision right now. I can't wait to make that decision. Um, and so we pulled together a lot of different techniques to try to address that problem. Um, we use uh, reinforcement learning to help us uh, understand uh, what is the best possible uh, decision. Um, and we also use reinforcement learning in an actor critic uh, structure uh, to learn the solution to the optimal value uh, function uh, and, and therefore the optimal controller. Um, and so we're, we're learning what the optimal controller is in real time, um, and that's the answer to, and I have to do it right now, kind of a question. Um, and one of the things that, I mean, the, a classic fundamental problem uh, that, that's philosophical to this question of how do you do something optimal in the presence of uncertainty is this trade-off between, well, do I explore the environment first so that I can learn the dynamics and then I can make the best possible decision? Or it, there's a cost to that learning, so maybe I should execute right now without having to, to learn. And how, how much do I need to learn? So that's always called the exploration versus exploitation problem. Um, we came up with a very clever, this, this uh, storing the input-output data concurrently and then using that in, in, in slower than real time. We were able to use that, and, and in reinforcement learning, that's typically implemented as a non-model-based approach, and you can only learn around the policy. And I'm going to show you the impacts of this in a moment. But with this um, uh, uh, input-output, saving the data, concurrent learning strategy, 
Um, we use the model. Maybe we know the model. Maybe we don't. We have different results for that. Um, but because we have a model, we're able to extrapolate uh, information in the whole task space. And so the power of that, the big implication of that, is that we're able to simultaneously explore as much computation as we have available while we exploit. So we're doing exploration and exploitation concurrently, not exploration versus exploitation. So we get much faster learning, as you'll see in just a moment. Um, it's expensive. Right now, we're very interested in, well, what is the cost of all this learning and all this computation? Um, what's the price that I have to pay? Um, dynamic programming, if you're familiar with optimal control. Um, <laughs> Siri didn't like that. Um, uh, dynamic programming, if you're familiar with that, is a very expensive process. There's a curse of dimensionality. Um, and we also face that for sure. Like I said, we're trying to understand um, uh, the computational cost. We've, we've done some things, and I'll touch on one of those things, uh, to help address the computational demands. Um, for example, we only look at uh, local information. Uh, we use sparse neural networks rather than having to retrain the whole neural network as we experience different parts of the state space. We only retrain in little pockets of the neural network. Um, so now that's kind of the bottom line up front. Now to kind of give a little bit of the details of that, um, here's a nonlinear differential equation. Um, and we have a control objective, uh, and we're, we're looking at the uh, infinite horizon uh, uh, problem where our cost is the interval over all of time, um, and we want to minimize, we want to have a penalty for our, our error, X, and we also want to have a penalty on our control action U, so this is a very common optimal control problem that we want to solve, and then the cost to go is um, we want to know the, the cost of, of that. Uh, the value function is the minimum control over all admissible controls from the time now and, until the end of time, which we don't know. Um, so, so after some process, then we form the hamilton jacobi bellman equation. So for those of you who do linear systems, then uh, if you don't have nonlinearities, then the hamilton jacobi bellman equation reduces to the LQR problem or the Riccati equation. Uh, which you can solve algebraically. Um, this is a nonlinear partial differential equation. It has uncertainties in it. We don't know how to solve it. Okay, and so a lot of people will just uh, will numerically try to address the problem. We're trying to do something a bit more analytical with with stability guarantees and analysis driven. And so um, and so if we were to solve that problem, then we could find the optimal controller. And so in the optimal controller in this middle equation here you see the partial derivative, the gradient of the value function, which is the solution to that nonlinear partial difference equation, which we don't know. Um, and so uh, our approach there, uh, and there's a community of people who take this approach, is to approximate the solution to that nonlinear differential equation. So a lot of the computational cost is in solving the value function, and so rather than solving the value function, we approximate the solution to the value function. So we're trading off a cost there. It's still expensive. We're still exploring how expensive. Um, and of course, we're not going to get the optimal solution. There is no optimal solution in the presence of uncertainty. Um, but we approximate the solution very well. Um, and again, so we have an actor, uh, which is the controller that we're approximating. And then we have a critic, which is the value function, which it tells us how good uh, we're doing, and we're learning to um, decide how to be a better critic, and we're learning how to be a better actor. Um, that's, what, that's what the neural network is doing for us. And very fortunately, um, if I go back uh, this, this hamilton jacobi bellman equation, we know that if we substitute in the optimal controller, that this equation is zero, okay? And so when we substitute in our, uh, so, so we approximate the value function, and so now our approximate optimal controller has approximations in here. And so if we plug in this approximate optimal controller instead of the actual optimal controller, that uh, HJB equation is no longer going to be zero. But great, we can measure that. And so we have a measure, it's called the Bellman error, of how suboptimal we are. And very fortunately now we can use this Bellman error as, a, as an error to drive our learning and drive our adaptation to um, learn how to be more optimal, and that's fantastic. Um, 
And so just to kind of show you some of the adaptation laws that result from the stability analysis of the underlying mathematics that we do, um, again, we have a gradient-based term that is, happens in real time that's driven by our Bellman error, this delta term. Um, and so this is our on trajectory learning, okay? And so that all these uh, yellow terms are that. And so uh, this is our like a least squares adaptation. This is our this is our critic. This is our after. Um, we have these gradient style terms here. Um, but then this concurrent learning, this sampling, where we extrapolate the Bellman error, we evaluate the Bellman error all over the the, the space. And I say, what would the Bellman error have been here? What would the Bellman error have been here? That's the simultaneous exploration and exploitation. And so those discrete data points, we can fold into the analysis through some of the mathematics that we use so that we can do off-trajectory learning as well. And that's what these terms in blue have been added into the adaptation model from the stability analysis enable us to do. I'm going to have to rerun this video a couple times because a lot's happening here very quickly. So the left is, um, we, we had a toy problem where we know analytically what the solution to the value function is. Okay, that's V, V star. And then we have, well, we're approximating the solution to that. Um, and so what, what this graph is a heat map of the difference between the actual value function and the approximated value function. And on the left, is we're doing this Bellman error extrapolation, this concurrent learning, exploitation, and exploration. And on the right is the traditional approach where you can only do on trajectory learning. And so this whole time that I've been talking about this, um, you see here, blue is good, blue is zero. So you see immediately it just turns blue. Well, almost immediately it turns blue because we're simultaneously exploring all of this space all at once, and it just, whew, we've learned it. Whereas to the right, we have to move around and wiggle around in the environment and excite different modes and find out all these things, and because we can only learn where we go. And that's horribly slow. As you can see, it's still learning, right? And the trajectory is, look at the trajectory difference between the one on the right and the one on the left, right? So this is the impact of encoding that model knowledge or approximate model knowledge. We can also simultaneously try and learn if we have uncertainties in the model. Um, uh, but that allows us to do this really cool exploration versus exploitation. Um, really quickly, you know, just trying to address some of the computational concerns. We can also break up uh, the, the, the world that we're trying to learn in, and uh, we can uh, just uh, tune pockets of the neural network, um, and then that reduces the, the uh, computational cost. And so what you can see is this little dot as it moves into the different colored zones there, the, the term on the right, the, our exploration term, that we just switch that out to, in this region, you should use these kind of terms. In this region, you should use these kinds of terms. And again, that just saves us in some of our computational costs. So a, an example, uh, so in, in airspace, um, so typically what uh, one would do is uh, throughout a nonlinear flight regime, uh, you would linearize the uh, dynamics about different operating points and you would come up with a gain scheduling technique to switch between these different models for, for different flight conditions. Um, this is an example, a famous example, of an F-16 longitudinal dynamics from the Stewart and Lewis book. Uh, Stevens and Lewis book. Um, and uh, these are three different models, uh, linear time invariant models that would approximate the nonlinear uh, um, equations. And so we have this approximate dynamic programming uh, to learn the optimal controller for each of those subsystems. And then in this problem, we just arbitrarily switch between the subsystems. Um, as you can see, we get great error convergence. But the cool thing about this is that, so now we're doing switching and learning. We're switching across these different dynamics. We're like gain scheduling across these different uh, subsystems. And so I have three color codes here. We're switching between a red subsystem, a blue subsystem, and a green subsystem. In particular, check out this green one. So this is learning. This is our, this is our critic weights, okay, in our reinforcement learning. And so uh, we, we, we went from these dynamics where we, we, we were learning something, and then we, we switched to these other dynamics. Okay, now we're learning something different. 
And so you can see the weights all change. And they, they hadn't had, you know, unlike these two dynamics, we didn't stay in the subsystem long enough for the learning to converge to anything. So we switched to another dynamic. We switched to another dynamic. Um, but what was cool here is when we switched back to the green, it immediately picked back up from where it had been learning and continued to learn. And so you can see this, the second time we switched to the red, we had already converged. The second time we switched to the blue, we'd already converged. The second time we switched to the green, we finished learning and we were starting to converge. Um, and then this is the difference uh, in the value function approximation. You can see that pretty quickly um, the mismatch in the actual value function and the approximated value function uh, goes to zero pretty quickly. Uh, so, and now we're looking at hierarchical learning for computational costs. We're looking at distributed learning, which is a very difficult problem because um, if person A learns something and person B learns something, well, did they learn it the same way? Did they understand it the same way? How can I combine? It's like a study group, right? I mean, study groups have this problem all the time. You know, well, you learned it your way and you learned it your way, but I don't understand it either way that you guys are trying to tell it to me. So how do you combine that information? That's a philosophical, uh, difficult problem to try and resolve. And then we're also trying to leverage some of the things that we did with deep learning and also apply it to this uh, learning the optimal value function. We haven't done that yet. So I've talked a little bit about switching while we're learning and switching uh, in, in the optimality. Um, and so now I want to finish up by talking about the intermittent joy of intermittent feedback. Okay, so now we don't have the joy of continuous feedback. We, we only have intermittent feedback. And um, it's a clever name for two reasons. Uh, the intermittent joy, meaning that sometimes it's great, sometimes it's a lot harder because we don't have all this feedback all the time. Um, and sometimes you can view the lack of feedback as a problem to try and overcome. Right? The adversary is blocking my, my uh, global position information, and I need that for, to, to trust where I am. Um, but sometimes it can be advantageous, right? Um, I can now move in ways that I couldn't move before because I've already figured out that I can tolerate a certain amount of time without having feedback. And so, so now I can maybe build that into my mission objectives. Um, and I'll show you uh, some of that in, in a moment. And um, one approach that people have had, this is kind of an old approach, no one really does this anymore, um, but they, they said, you know, doggone it, I'm going to have feedback all the time, and I'm going to make it so that I have feedback. And so one of the reasons why you might not have feedback is like the sensor modality, like if you're using a camera to close the loop. Um, well, a camera has a limited field of view, and so if, some, if I turn my camera, then things that left my field of view, now I don't have feedback about that anymore. And so... Researchers that have tried to like force to always have feedback, they end up doing silly things. Like um, if information about the location of this target is the only way I know about where I am in the world uh, with my mobile robot, and I have to keep that target in my field of view. And so like a car, right? Um, so the only way that they can move in a way to keep the target in the field of view is you know, drive forward a little bit, okay, turn a little bit, drive backwards a little bit, move forward a little bit, turn a little bit, drive forward, back, back up a little bit, and it's this ridiculous motion. And so couldn't you do something much better if you just said, wait, okay, I have a, a guess of where the target is. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to field the view a little bit. It's okay that I'm not going to have feedback about it. I can understand. I can calculate how long that it's okay for that to be out of my field of view before I need that information again. And so I just plan my trajectory to allow it to go out of the field of view. And, and then I plan to revisit it in a quick enough amount of time, and then it's okay, and I can get much better trajectories that way. Um, the thing, the technical obstacle that you have here is that um, you can have globally exponentially stable subsystems and switch between them in a way that destabilizes the system. And it's a very famous example by Brannicke that shows that. Um, so then when we examine these kinds of systems, we have now two tasks. We have to analyze the stability of the individual subsystem. We also have to analyze the frequency of the switching. And uh, that causes us sometimes to have dwell time conditions, which say, hey, I have to look at the target for this amount of time, or I can only dwell without feedback for a certain amount of time, or I'm going to go unstable. If you're familiar with traditional Lyapunov analysis, uh, you know that V is positive, and you want V dot to always be negative. 
even if you're not familiar with it, you can understand the concept that if I have something that's positive and it's always decreasing, then it's going to remain bounded and it's eventually going to go to zero and you have all these nice things about it. That's, in a nutshell, the underlying scaffolding of all this mathematics. But when you have this intermittent feedback, uh, things can grow. <laughs> oh, that's scary from a Lyapunov analysis perspective because when things grow, things can go unstable. Things can uh, become unbounded. Errors grow. That's very bad. But the idea is if you can allow it just to grow a little bit in a controlled amount of time, and actually if you can understand your rate of convergence versus your rate of divergence, then you can time it so that you're, you're over a, a sequence, you're always decreasing, well then it's okay. And, and that's essentially the strategy that's employed so we can have discrete dynamics due to all kinds of you have vehicle dynamics, the decision logic, maybe our communication structure or sensing structure. And we use this switch systems theory, and that gives us performance certificates. It, it tells us scalability of problems. It gives us timing conditions. So here's the problem that we did. Uh, you can't see it yet, but here's a quadcopter. Uh, these mobile robots have no sensors. We scattered them around the lab, and we said, hey, we want everyone to converge in this uh, circle here. Um, and so because they have no sensors, if we just let them converge, uh, the errors are so bad in the dead reckoning, uh, the drift for, for reading the encoders, um, if I pointed the robot this way, well, it may end up going that way, and they, they wouldn't converge. And so we have this quadcopter basically be a, a sensor delivery agent. So it delivers a packet of information to this, to this mobile robot, then it runs over here and tells this mobile robot, hey, no, this is where you are, error correct. And in doing so, and its communication radius is this circle. So it comes over here, it tells it its information, okay, I need to correct. And so it adjusts. And then, and then the analysis tells us how frequently we need to visit each agent, how long we need to stay with each agent in order to ensure that everyone converges to the center. Um, we have another interesting problem that we call herding. And so... Uh, just as an easy example to think about, think about like a sheep herding problem. Um, oh, this is the wolf pack, right? Okay, so instead of a sheep dog, we'll, we'll think of it being a wolf, right? So we have a wolf that's trying to corral the sheep, okay? And uh, the wolf doesn't have direct control over the sheep. The wolf doesn't grab the leg of the sheep and drag it where it wants it to go. The wolf just, it understands the sheep is going to have a reaction to it. It's going to be repelled by the wolf. It's scared of the wolf. And so the wolf, just by its mere presence, can have an impact on the motion of the sheep. But it's indirect, right? And so we looked at this kind of a problem, and we said, okay, well, we've got these goals. We have our target agents that we want to go to those goals. So there's an error. Um, these are the sheep. And we have a herder. This is the wolf. Why is the wolf? And the dynamics of the sheep are such that they're either going to be repelled or attracted uh, by other sheep and the wolf, right? Um, and so the, there's some, so that's a characteristic, and then there's that other nonlinearities that, that may be involved there. And then we can control the wolf, all right? Um, and so, yeah, we, we do some, some work uh, here, kind of, you know, rather straightforward uh, backstepping if you're familiar with that technique. But um, again, we use this concurrent learning concept where we're collecting input-output data, um, so maybe every sheep doesn't react to the wolf the same way. And I don't know how the sheep are going to react. And I only have a minimum amount of time with the sheep. So in the little bit of time I have with each sheep, I have to learn, okay, how are you going to respond to me? Uh, because the next time I come back to you, I need to know that so that I can, uh, you know, optimally or, sub or the best I can uh, get you to corral and go where I want you to go. And so every interaction that we have with the sheep we store that data, we offline process it, and then we use it. Um, and so in our adaptation law, again, you have these continuous time gradient terms and then these, um, and then these uh, discrete time uh, terms due to the concurrent learning. Um, and so here's an example of that. Um, so the quadcopter again, uh, these uh, are different sized, uh, they're paper plates uh, with construction paper. Uh, between the top and bottom paper plate. So there's no motors, no sensors. It's just literally a, a paper constructed item. 
And the way that the, the, the way they move is based on the aerodynamics that are pushing that, that paper plate to slide on the floor. We didn't model that complex behavior, okay? But we're learning that complex behavior. And again, each of those paper plates, you see they like, this is a taller one, the one beside it over here is a shorter one. Um, but despite that, and the quadcopter only gets a little bit of time and then it switches between different ones. So while it interacts with the agent, it has to learn its dynamics and be able to corral it. And so, yay, it herded the sheep, right? Good wolf. And then if I were, okay, well, I don't have my, my pointer. So uh, maybe we don't have time to let this continue to run. But uh, it's in pause mode now, and we're going to switch over to a different objective where, if you remember, the yellow one started on the left, the pink one started on the right. Now it's going to make the pink ones go to the right, and the yellow ones just going to sort them and push the yellow ones to the right and the pink ones to the left. And so you can see it just kind of moves them around. And then it says, okay, hey, Pinky, I want to go over to the left over there. Um, and it, it does this sorting problem. Okay, so left, the yellow one, yeah, you move that way. Pink one, yeah, you move that way. And then it goes through and it does a sorting problem. So kind of interesting. What a fun example. Creative grad student came up with this paper plate thing. Um, some of this original problem was motivated by a sponsor that we had uh, uh, in the Navy that was interested in mine countermeasures. And so with this problem, you have an underwater vehicle and you don't have GPS, you don't have absolute sensing underwater. Um, they do a scan they, and they're looking for bombs. Uh, then they want to protect the ships. And um, if, they, if they find something or if they want to report, or uh, every so often they have to very expensively stop what they're doing, go to the surface of the water. Okay, so now they have absolute position sensing again. They can kind of recalibrate themselves. They can exchange data, go back down, now go research. It's a very expensive operation. And so uh, what we did is this relay explorer problem again where we want a group of people that are always searching uh, for mines and never do anything but that. And then we have a, a, a data fairy, F-E-R-R-Y, that, um, that moves between the, the exploring agents, communicates with them locally, and, and gives them um, updated position information, uh, maybe even exchanges like, oh, hey, I saw a bomb back there. Uh, you should tell someone to look out for that or this area is all clear or whatever. Um, and so we have different uh, uh, estimates um, of, of, of where we are. Uh, there's um, regions where we don't have feedback, which is underwater. We have regions where there is feedback, um, uh, and that, that will be when it surfaced. Here we're just going to describe that by some circles. And our desired trajectory is this dotted line always outside of the feedback region. So we, we want an agent to operate in an environment where they never get feedback. They only get feedback when our, our relay agent, our ferry, comes and says, oh, hey, this is where you are, by the way. Um, but it has to predict where that agent's going to be. It has to do its timing in such a way that it will mate up because it's very easy for those to get lost if you don't do this appropriately. And this switch systems analysis gives us the tool sets to let us know, predict where it's going to be, as well as the timing of, of, of how often to visit it. Um, interestingly, there's some potentially unstable dynamics in here. Like we couldn't even stabilize them because we don't have measurements of the errors um, during that time. And it's an unstable dynamic system. Um, and so this is some of the underlying mathematics to develop the dwell time. Uh, so here's a video. Uh, this is not a Relay Explorer. This is kind of like a pre-Relay Explorer or a single agent, okay? So this green, this gray area here is, is where it has feedback. The desired path is always outside of the feedback region. Um, and so it's going to leave the feedback region, um, go into the environment where it doesn't have feedback. Um, look, the error grows because of dead reckoning errors. The air conditioner in this room blows the quadcopter off path. Uh, and so you can actually see on this side of the circle, the errors are worse than on this side of the circle. <laughs> so kind of a, an interesting aerodynamics problem. Um, but uh, we, we have a trajectory that, that we switch. So the analysis tells us, hey, 
you can be out in the wild this long, and then you have to come back to the feedback region in order to know where you are, or you're going to get lost. You won't even know how to come back to the feedback region if you don't do it that often. And so, um, darn, let me... Oh, well, I, I can't remember how to switch the things, but, you know, it, it goes around. It does this thing. Um, these are the, the results. Um, this was our air threshold, our max tolerance, and you can see that it, it always was in that tolerance. The red, you see the growth. That's terrifying for someone in my area because airs are blowing up. It's going unstable, but, but we only allow that to happen just enough um, to, uh, so that we remain stable. Um, this is the Relay Explorer problem. Uh, we have uncertainty in our relay agent. Um, uh, so our, ad our adaptation law is different if we um, have feedback or if we don't have feedback. And before we've learned something, like our concurrent learning, we have to gather enough input-output information before we have like improved learning. And so there's a time before we have enough learning or before we have enough learning uh, as up here, or after we have enough learning down here. Uh, and so here's another video that kind of ex explains the, the impact of that. So our desired trajectory outside of the feedback region, uh, there's this mountainous terrain that prevents it from going in the feedback region. So this is where uh, we get state information. Um, Again, this is with no relay agent, so, so this is just saying, hey, do the circle, but it didn't have any feedback, so it did a terrible job of it. Um, and so now we turn on the relay agent, so now the quadcopter will go uh, between the feedback region in here and uh, out in the wild, and um, because of these periodic updates, no surprise, the mobile robot is able to track the desired trajectory of the circle uh, much better. Um, you can see it does error correction. Um, you know, error correction, and the timing of this is based on the analysis. Um, so much better performance uh, with the relay agent. And so I, I said that we, we can also understand the scalability of the problem from the switched analysis. And so here we have multiple agents, um, and uh, now the quadcopter has to service multiple agents. You can see there's gross error here, um, and then it will go and revisit it, revisit it and then it corrected it. Uh, it's getting gross error here, now it corrected it. And so we can balance how much error tolerance we can have based on how often the agent needs to service the other agents. Um, and then that provides a bound for well, how many agents and based on your uncertainty budget can you afford. Um, and those problems, uh, well, they're very innovative because they were the first to do that kind of a problem, but they were all circles. And circles are super easy because uh, no matter where you are, you know, you're just a certain distance away from the radius of the circle. So that, that really made it a lot easier, which is a good starting point. So now we're looking at arbitrarily shaped uh, feedback regions, which makes the problem a lot harder. How do you optimize the trajectory to get back into the feedback region? Um, how do you plan to maximize your time outside of the feedback region? Those are still questions that we're uh, struggling with. We're coming up with different <laughs> strategies to try to um, um, learn how to know the best way to enter our feedback region or come back. Um, and just really quickly to finish up, uh, some other examples where this intermittency comes into play. So the, the blue and green dots are a feature tracking problem that is, is uh, and that are locked on the features in the image. And then based on how those features move in time and space, we can understand how our camera is moving and we can understand things about the world. Structure for motion is what this problem is called. However, um, look at what happens with this telephone pole as it crosses our screen. Oh, we lost all those dots. So just this telephone pole sweeping across the screen, it's like an eraser, like a magic eraser, and then we lose all that information. And so intermittency in an imaging system is, is, a very, is, an, is an inherent problem. This is that herding video again. Now, when we did that herding example, we were using a motion capture system, so it was like a GPS sensing, essentially. We weren't using image feedback to close a loop. If we were to use image feedback, you can see, look, I don't, so sometimes I see one plate, sometimes I see the other plate, so I'm having to switch across the different plates, and that causes the, the target to leave the field of view. And so that's another motivating example for these kinds of problems. 
Um, this was a cool problem that we examined. So we have one quadcopter in the air that wants to monitor the traffic in a road network. Um, and we don't have enough budget to have one quadcopter follow every car in the road network. We don't even know what the road network is. Um, and so in this example, uh, you can see down here, the quadcopter initially followed all the time this one robot, um, and this is the virtual road network up here, until it learned what the road network looked like, okay? Then after it learned what the road network looked like, now you'll see in this video, it switches between the different targets. And it switches based on, it, it knew this road network and it knows where the decision points are. So in between these two intersections, it knows, well, it's just gonna continue on to the next intersection. So I have that time budget to go visit someone else who may be entering an intersection. And so this is another interesting problem on how to monitor multiple vehicles with just one car where you can't keep everything in your field of view. Um, if I ask someone to look at this problem, uh, as an engineer, you would say, okay, well, I'm gonna do like a zero order hold. Whenever the thing goes out of the field of view, I'm just gonna say, okay, well, whatever it was the last time I saw it, let's just lock it there, okay? And you can do that. We, we do some math and we show that the thing that you would do as an engineer, zero or hold, actually works, providing the switching is slow enough. But if the switching becomes faster, then we use a predictor, a model-based predictor, which gives us improved performance. And so um, here, this is an experiment where we did a zero order hold. The uh, mobile robot goes out of the field of view from time to time. But overall, it's able to, and you can see the red is a zero order hold where it just kind of locks its estimate. But you can see that it continues to track, okay? Um, oh, geez, I really need to speed this video. <laughs> so anyway, it goes in and out of the field of view. This is the predictor versus the estimate, um, and we do an okay job there. And, uh, well... I don't have time to show you that video, but what's cool is uh, they're moving the video around, then, then there's a moving camera case where they move the camera case around at the same time, and then he puts his hand over the lens and he moves the camera around, and then he takes his hand off the lens and he's still moving it. Our Navy sponsor said, at the beginning, before the demo, he said, just very arrogantly to me, he said, you can't do it. And then we showed him this video and he said, okay. I stand corrected. <laughs> and so, because in, in some of the experimental results, you can see here, so this switching was fast enough that the zero order hold failed. Um, but by using the predictor, that provided us a longer time budget uh, because we could stay stable longer. The growth was, was, was less rapid. And, uh, and even with the same switching between these two examples, we're able to converge very nicely. So um, that's it. I'm sorry if I'm a little bit late. Uh, it was a real joy. Uh, so thank you. Any questions? It's a very timely topic, and I think a lot of us still don't understand how it works. <laughs> Even with all the math, I still don't understand. A lot of breath. I apologize. I didn't get a well, chance to get out of depth. So when you talk about autonomy, you're talking about all the systems that are at autonomous. In the real world, when we're moving towards autonomous systems, some systems are going to be autonomous, some systems are going to be manual. How do we ensure that they interact? Because the human brain is works very differently than the autonomous system that is trained. Absolutely. So how do you think this, this whole shift is going to occur towards autonomous systems when there is still manual systems working? Yeah, and, and that's a great problem, and that, that is the cutting edge of, of some research. Um, you know, uh, one way to answer the question is, well, just do whatever the human is telling you to do. Um, that's a, an old... But the, human, the whole idea of the human does not need to be involved, right? Yeah, but, that, but the, so that's an old answer. The, a new answer is when you have humans mixed in with the autonomy, try to predict, learn human behavior... Um, in fact, I saw a great presentation by someone working in this area the other day where they, they develop models of human behavior, like different, like say you're driving and it's foggy or it's rainy or it's, it's in the sunshine. You have different desired behaviors and like your adaptive cruise control. 
And so they do machine learning methods for, they, they like, you as a human operator adjust, like, okay, I, I want to follow this close or this far away because it's foggy, or I'm going to hit my brakes this many times. I, yeah, I'm using my adaptive cruise control and I hit my brakes this number of times to change that adaptive cruise control in this scenario, and in this scenario, I hit my brakes much less. And so they're running an, an AI agent collecting all that data, and then the next time you're in a foggy situation, and it knows that you're in a foggy situation, it will automatically adjust that adaptive cruise control to accommodate for your desired behaviors. And I think that's fascinating. But, but those are some of the things that people... The classic question, right, I was in one of these conferences, and there the autonomy person get up there and they said, the classic question is, you're driving on a, on a street, a residential street, and suddenly a basketball rolls onto the street. You know normally a human behavior is that the kid going to run behind the basketball. Does the autonomous system know that? Yeah. So how do you train the autonomous system to expect that the kid would run behind the ball because you've got to stop for the ball, right? So uh, we asked this person this, this similar question. And they actually have models for these kind of extreme That's events. That's why we got to yeah. work on all this stuff and try to actually make the desirable behavior of the system to, to do that. Of course, a few Tesla accidents don't prove that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the fun things, like the F-16 example that I gave, um, so w we had learning for each of the individual subsystems, but then we had a human switching between the models. And so now a result that we're looking at is how to have an agent to learn the best way to switch, which is a real fundamental difference because now in terms of the human dictating the mission behavior, you're going to switch according to this protocol, which is, the, which is a mission design. Now we're saying, hey, AI agent, you figure out the, you know, when's the best time for, to switch between these different controllers. And so now you're doing mission planning, which is which is a, a weird barrier to cross from my perspective. Exciting, it's different math, it's different challenges. Um, so, but that, that is kind of the cutting edge of how do we accommodate for the human, how do we remove the human, how do we approximate human behavior, so. That's more complicated than. Much more complicated. Any, any autonomous system. <laughs> uh, yeah, quick question on the uh, opposite feedback regions. Right? Uh, I mean, I guess once you have, uh, predefined feedback loop region, you can kind of model that. But what if you have regions that are constantly evolving because of changing weather mm. conditions? And how do you quantify it? For yeah. Region? Well, we're just now working on the static arbitrary shape. Okay. Uh, once we can solve that, then we can think about a dynamic moving shape, which would be a much harder problem because you basically that that's like, how do you learn a time varying thing? Right, and, and that's a very hard problem because it's dynamically changing, and so learning dynamically changing things is a different kind of learning. So that's the next next step. <laughs> Great question. All right, we're going to stop. You go ahead. Thank you. So uh, you know, the RL method and concurrent learning. So, it's a, so you're still trying to create a model, but what can you combine like already known models which you people call physics plus deep learning? So can you do that? Is there a benefit to that just rather than just completely learning the model? Yeah, so, so we, we are now looking at that very problem. And you remember I showed this picture where we were turning on different segments of the neural network as it kind of visited different sub, the, different, the four colored blocks. So we're using those ideas to explore. Uh, so maybe we're in a region where we have a, or, or an operating domain where we have a very good understanding of the behavior of the dynamic system. So maybe now we're trusting the model more. Um, an example that we kind of talk about in our group is, okay, well, let's say you have a, a, a car that you're doing an, an automated control.